shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and then proclaim, My God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. My cousin and I played football at the same time at UMD. Now, before you think, Pastor, this, this could be true, we're not sure. <laughs> or are we, it might be true, we're not sure, uh, who knows. Or this is a really bad rendition of Two Truths and a Lie. I will say that my cousin Paul, who's actually not my first cousin, he's my third cousin, and I didn't actually meet him until he was a sophomore at UMD and I was a freshman. He, he actually played for the Bulldogs, right? But I did play on an intramural football team. Now you could tell that I was playing with a group of Christians from my, my on-campus Christian group because they were gracious enough to let me play. Those of you who know me well, you know I have no business playing team sports that, that involve others, right? But, but they let me play. <laughs> So we are in our series called Together. In the first week, we talked about connecting in a disconnected world. And the next week, we talked about leaning in to vulnerability. Just realized I never actually took out my message. There we go. <laughs> Looking past the profile picture and leaning in to vulnerability. Then we talked about too many worlds to manage and how we're really not wired to manage chaos from so far away, but we are called back to the community that we find ourselves in, the community that we dwell. Last week we talked about, before you unfriend me, I'm talking about inevitably in all relationships, we will enter into conflict. It's not a matter of whether we enter conflict, it's how we deal with each other when we disagree. And today we are looking at being alone but not lonely. You know, in the past 30 to 40 years or so, we have so many different kinds of personality theories, right? Like, and I love them, I think they're great. I like to study them, I like to find out more about people, I think it helps me understand where people are coming from and their perspectives. But one of my favorite is the introvert extrovert. How, how many of you have heard of introverts extroverts in here? Yeah, and those of you online, how many would you say that you're more of an introvert? You gather more of your energy truly by being alone, okay? And how, you, how many of you would say, I'm more of an extrovert, I, I really prefer and gain my energy from being around others, that, that, that's me. Well, a number of years ago, I came across my own scale, you know, I think none of us are, are clearly black and white, you can't put most of us in one box, right? So I have a scale that says there's the outgoing extroverts. These are the people that walk into the room, they're clearly outgoing, they're comfortable to be around, they just soak up the energy, right? Like they, they just bring life wherever they are. And nobody doubts that they're an extrovert, right? And then you have your reflective extroverts. That's probably more where I fall. Or sometimes I may actually look introverted, but truly I'd rather be around people. I get my energy from being around people. Some of you may be like this too. And, and, I, can, and, and I don't have to be talking. I just, just like to be around people. And then you have your social introverts. And these are the people who may look extroverted, but truly on the inside actually prefer and gain their energy from being alone. I have an uncle like this. He, he looks like he, you know, he can be in any social setting, but truly he'd rather be by himself. And then you have your reflective introverts that nobody questions are introverts. These are the people who truly want to be alone. They look like they want to be alone. The two of my family members, their names are behind introvert in the, in the you know, dictionary because they truly would probably just rather not have to deal with people at all, right? And we find ourselves somewhere on this scale, each one of us. And we find our, our energy coming from different times and, and different needing to be with people 
or, or alone. I think even people who are the most extroverted still have times where they need to be alone, they need to calm down. And people who like to be introverted, they, it's still a healthy balance to be in relationship and connection with others. Right? And when we look at Jesus, we look at the gospel stories, and we watch Jesus' life, he really balanced this well. And, and I would actually argue that Jesus, you know, I, this is just my opinion, but I think he was kind of a perfect blend of all personality theories at once because he was perfect, right? So, so he was perfectly introverted and extroverted. And we see that he, he, he was magnetic. You know, it wasn't like they put out on Facebook in five days, we're going to have this big gathering and, you know, put out a poster and a call and everything like that. People just came to him. Thousands of people gathered in his presence. I, I think he was funny. I think Jesus was hilarious. I think people, he was magnetic. People wanted to be around him. He was that outgoing extrovert, right? He just drew people in. But then there were times that, that he had small gatherings or parties and he was in more intimate settings. When we look through the Gospels, it describes most of his time he spent with his disciples in that intimate place. They were just learning life from Jesus just by being around him. But then, at least more than a dozen times throughout the Gospel stories, it describes that Jesus went away to be alone. An isolated place to be with the Father. Mark 1, 29 through 39 is our main text for today. If you'd like to follow along, you can always go to Bible Gateway on your device. Or if you happen to have a, a Bible in front of you, I'm in Mark 1, chapter 1, verses 29 through 39, which say this. After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, a couple of his buddies he hangs out with, they went to Simon and Andrew's house, a couple more buddies that he hangs out with. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick and in bed with a fever. Now it wasn't odd that he would be at this house, but she, she happens to be sick. And so they told Jesus about it right away. So he went to her bedside, took her by the hand, helped her, helped her sit up, and then the fever left her. I love this. Get this. Here is a woman of woman, right? She, she gets up and she prepares a meal for him. Hey, now I feel better. Let's, let's all have dinner. Like, I don't know if I would be doing that, but bless her. Okay, that evening after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. Again, there's not like, it, there's not an event planned for this. They're just gathering because Jesus is there. They're like, hey, is it, is it, you know, Simon and Andrew's house? Let's go. I, I, you know, let's see if he can heal my, my sickness. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases and cast so many demons because the demons knew who he was. He didn't even allow them to speak. He does he ministers to this town all night. And then it says before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. They're like, Jesus is already up. Where'd he go? And they're like, hey, everyone's looking for you. They want, they want to hear more. They want to know more. And he says, look, we got to go on to another town. I need to preach to them too. This is why I came. So they left. They went out of the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues, healing more people, casting out more demons. A number of years ago, I went to the biggest baby shower that I've ever heard of, seen, ever been to, right? There was a reason that this baby shower was so big. This, this person is just a wonderful person. She's actually since moved out of Minnesota, but she just has that, that personality, the you know, outgoing extrovert that just, you want to be around her, right? It was huge. And, and honestly, I didn't know very many people there. And it was one of those situations where I felt really out of place. Even though there were all kinds of people, I felt alone, right? I mean, have you been there? I think we've all experienced moments where even if we're in a crowd of people, we can feel utterly alone. And, and honestly, I, I left the party early. I don't know if I would have done it again. I don't know if it was the right thing to do. You know, and, and I thought nobody will notice, but of course this woman is so wonderful. She texted me later. She's like, ah, I'm so sorry, you know, but she's like, goodbye to you. And, uh, you know, I'm like, well, I had to work or something like that. But we find ourselves in, even when we're around people that we know, but there's things going on in our lives 
and they don't know the full story, we can feel so utterly alone. Right? We find ourselves in those places. I mean, the reality is that other than I like being outdoors and I like being active, I had no business playing football in this intramural team in college. The real reason I was there is because I didn't want to be alone. In college, I found myself working a ton, taking as many classes as I could at once. I was in a ministry group called Chi Alpha. I would, my grandparents were all still alive at the time, and I wanted to take advantage of that. I was living you know, in Duluth, where they all lived, and so I wanted to visit them as much as I could, tried to get to the gym as much as I could, and skate as much as I could. I was involved in anything extra that I could possibly get my hands on. And the reality is that I stayed busy so that I didn't have to face the fact that I felt alone. Have you been there? These moments in our lives when we feel so utterly alone. Gordon had this great, Pastor Gordon had this great line in his e -Devo, if you read it this week, that said, the problem of loneliness isn't simply solved by the presence of others. We can be alone and not lonely, and we can be with others and we can be lonely. At this time in my life, Psalm 46.10 became a core verse that said, Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. It was like God was saying to me, Stop with the crazy busy around you and recognize that my presence is wherever you are. Recognize that my presence is right here. If COVID has offered us anything, it's a moment to pause, to stop, to be still, and know that God is with us. See, in the midst of being alone, we don't have to be lonely. At least three times in the book of John, Jesus talks about going away but not being completely alone. John 16, 32 says it best. He says, yet I am not alone for my Father. He is with me. In our text from Mark, we see Jesus, he, he ministers to many. He ministers to an entire town. They're all gathered. But then what does he do? He goes to an isolated place to be alone with the Father, filled with the presence of God before he goes on to the next place to minister, to bring his presence to more people. He ministers from a place of being connected to God. And something wonderful happens in our lives when we allow some alone time for the purpose of connecting with God. We clear out the clutter, when we let go of the noise, when we, we step away from the chaos, we let go of our own thoughts or others' thoughts or our opinions or others' opinions of us. We make ourselves available to God. We learn to hear and listen to His voice. Creating alone time with God is a spiritual discipline. When you're alone or, or, or you live alone, sometimes it can still be hard to, to, to create that time where you're purposely alone with God. But, the, but this is Emmanuel. This is the name of who Christ is. God with us. Never truly alone. And when you live with other people and you've got the chaos going on, I know that sometimes you have to be a little creative in seeking out and creating space and time to be alone. I can't tell you the number of stories I've heard of moms who locked the bathroom door for more than 10 minutes just to find a moment to be alone. <laughs> no music, no podcast, no outside distractions, nothing else but the presence of God. First Kings 19, 11 through 13, this, this is a scripture where you hear that, that God wasn't in the storm, God wasn't in the fire, God wasn't in the big and the obvious. God was in the whisper. God was in the quiet moment. God wants to be with you, and he's jealous for your time. He's jealous for your attention. He's jealous to pour out and speak to you personally and tell you how much he loves and adores and wants to be with you. Jesus wants to speak into your life. We allow the power of the Holy Spirit to satisfy our souls. Around, around the same time, um, 
in college, my, my first two really good friends were, were Sarah and Andrew. And the three of us did a lot together until Sarah and Andrew, uh, who are now married and have three children and live in Minneapolis, decided that they were more than friends, <laughs> which was great by me. I just remember the time when they were like, um, you know, we love hanging out with you, but we, you know, we just want some time to be alone, right? And isn't that how God is with us? I desire the time to be just with you, intimate with you. The power of the Holy Spirit can come and fill those places and satisfy our souls in a way that nothing else can. Hebrews 6. 18 through 20, tell us, so God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him, fled to him for refuge, can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. It leads us through the curtain into God's inner sanctuary. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Our Father, who is our refuge, the hope that we trust is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. God's inner sanctuary, his presence in us. That Jesus would, would have come and, and allowed, made a way so that we could be with God by the presence of the Holy Spirit at work within us. We can enter into the presence of God because the Holy Spirit makes a way for us. Moments of being alone can be the most precious moments in the presence of God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, as, as we look to you and you alone to satisfy our souls, to satisfy the inner sanctuary within us, God. You alone are the one that can fill those empty places, that can speak to us in lonely times and lonely places. And so, Lord, help us to remember to seek you first, to find you, to allow our lives to be full of your presence, no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing. It is in you that we find our refuge. We thank you for this. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.
accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit lives within me because you died in Rome die for me amazing love I know it's true and it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you you are my king Hola. 